It feels like the Metroidvania genre is going through something of a renaissance over the past few years. Metroidvanias, 2D action platformers, based around exploring a unified world and unlocking new paths through gaining skills and keys, never really went away. Arguably indie gaming's first breakout hit, Cave Story, has ensured that these games will always exist from smaller creators. But for a while they felt like a rare treat, with only occasional installments completely ignored by AAA gaming. Metroid Fusion was followed by a long silence among the series' 2D entries, which was only broken by the Wii's Other M, a game so widely disliked that it killed the franchise for over a decade. Konami's public departure from the games industry meant Castlevania was all but dead. In the late aughts, early teens, these games felt like a rare treat. Baldus Story, Guacamelee, Dust, and Elysian Tale, Shadow Complex, the first SteamWorld Dig, these games were around, but it wasn't where the creative energy of the game development community as a whole seemed to be focused. But then, in the second half of the 2010s, it felt like the genre suddenly exploded. Ori and the Blind Forest, Axiom Verge, Hollow Knight, Blasphemous, Sundered, Bloodstained, Time Spinner, Owlboy, Death's Gambit, Dead Cells, Yoku's Island Express, Ender Lilies, Rain World, even the legendarily cancelled Metroid Dread finally released in 2021, to both fan and critical acclaim. It went from being a genre with a steady trickle of releases to an absolute flood of quality games. I hesitate to even call the market oversaturated, because honestly, all of the games I just mentioned, or at least the majority of them which I've played, are extremely good, and all of them have their own hooks and reasons to pay attention to them. Whether it's Metroid Dread's viscerally satisfying action and AAA polish, Hollow Knight's expansive world and melancholy atmosphere, Ori's hardcore platforming challenge and gorgeous visuals, or Death's Gambit's inventive spins on tried-and-true mechanics. All of these games are worth your time. Somehow, as impossible as it seems, I feel like we're getting more good games than bad out of this rush on the medium. What it does mean, however, is that there are more Metroidvanias coming out these days than any one person can reasonably play. I love this genre of game, and I feel like every time I play one, three more interesting ones have come out by the time I've finished. While that's great for an enthusiast of the genre, that can also mean some great games get lost in the shuffle. Not necessarily selling poorly or reviewing poorly, but never quite getting their day in the sunlight like they deserve. Today, I'd like to highlight one such game a game which I have seen almost no one talk about, despite it being among my favorite games of the decade so far, a game called Grime. Grime is a game from the Israeli studio Cloverbyte, released for PC on August 2nd, 2021, with a free DLC expansion, Colors of Rot, released on December 15th, 2022. Ports for PS4 and Xbox One were released alongside this DLC on December 15th, with a Switch port still coming at an unannounced date. Grime is set in a world that is equal parts hauntingly beautiful and repulsive. A surreal place where the ground itself can be made of flesh, of teeth, of bone. The inhabitants of this world are mostly, made of inorganic materials, primarily stone, given shape by a force called the Breath, or the Breath of the Parent. The Breath has created a world without regard for form or function, and the beings who are animated by it are deformed or misshapen. Heads the size of torsos, with tiny arms and legs sprouting out of them animated arms, deprived of four of the senses, and reaching out to interact with the world in the only way they have ever known. A shaped human face which cracks apart into a spindly beast. These creatures are burdened by a pain, that which they call the old pain, constantly haunting them. The overwhelming feeling that they are wrong, that they should not be. This game is a tour 
of bizarre ways in which these creatures will all try to escape the old pain. This ache of knowing, instinctively feeling that they are wrong. You, however, the player character, are special. You are a seemingly unique being, a walking black hole absorbing everything in your path, disassembling and reassembling at will, gaining more mass, more strength, with everything you destroy. You are called Aklan, and Endgiver by the people of this world. Figuring out what that means, what you are, and what your purpose is, forms the central mystery of the game. The game begins at the literal birth of our player character, given life, given breath, by some sort of god-beings in a cutscene we won't be able to fully contextualize until the very end of the game. We start in an area called the Weeping Cavity, which isn't suggestive at all. Grimes' combat places an extremely heavy emphasis on its parry and absorb mechanic. While playing the game, you can tap R1, or the equivalent on your controller of choice, to parry, regardless of what weapon you carry, or even without any weapon at all. The reason for this is that the parry animation shows the Aklan catching attacks with its black hole head, rather than using any sort of weapon. To illustrate just how important this mechanic is, the player actually begins without access to any weapon, and there is no unarmed attack. The reason for this is because the way the game implements parries is its most defining mechanic. Enemy health bars are broken into red and gray segments. If you successfully parry an attack and the enemy's health is currently within a red segment, you will absorb all of that red health segment. If the enemy's health is in a gray segment, you'll reflect the attack, usually leaving them open to a follow-up attack, along with other effects which can be specced into via the game's trait system. If an enemy's health bar is a single red segment, that means you can one-shot that enemy with a single parry. Those who don't like performing parries in games will likely struggle with how integral to the experience they are here, but I think Grime is actually a really good game for learning parries. The parry window, the timing for correct execution of the parry, is extremely generous right off the bat, and the animation and sound makes performing them feel super satisfying. Something which I think is extremely smart is that the game's earliest enemies, sculpted pots with arms protruding from them, do not deal damage to you at all. They'll merely reach out and gently push you backwards if they touch you. By starting the player with no weapon, but facing them first with harmless enemies, the player is forced to learn the parry mechanic in a low-stakes way. The game then moves on to enemies who can deal damage to you, but ones with long, obvious wind-ups, perfect for early practice of this mechanic. The reason why learning how to parry and absorb these enemies is so important is because this also leads into a few of the game's other mechanics. The first, and most obvious, is that each successfully absorbed health segment will fill up a segment of the player's breath meter. When an entire bar of breath is full, the player can use that bar to heal themselves. This is the game's primary healing mechanic. While the Colors of Rot DLC does add a reusable healing item, similar to Dark Souls' famous Estus Flask, you have to get pretty far into the game to unlock this. You find these crystal creatures who each drop one-third of the item that lets you heal. I like how the DLC placed these crystal creatures in front of some of the game's more obscure secrets, and has them teleport into those sections, subtly telling the player that a major secret is nearby. It's well done. Even if you 100% complete the game, the available charges for this healing item caps out at 4, so absorbing any breath you can is incredibly important. It's hard to imagine new players getting far in the game at all without engaging with this system. Another important reason you'll want to be absorbing enemies is the game's trait system. Every enemy in the game has an associated entry in a monster manual in the game's menu and any enemy that can be killed by absorbing it, which is nearly every enemy in the game, has an associated trait. These traits are unlocked by absorbing a specific number of that enemy, different for each enemy, 
usually in proportion to the difficulty of that specific enemy. These traits can vary wildly, from simply increasing maximum health or focus, the game's name for stamina, to ones that will change how you interact with the game on a more fundamental level, such as one which heals you whenever you absorb an enemy, or else grants a buff if you reflect enemies instead, which lets you heal on damaging enemies similar to Bloodborne's rally system. One even increases the game's parry window, making it easier to correctly perform, while another makes you take reduced damage if you attempt to parry, but fail which can also help learning the system early on. Just unlocking these perks by absorbing enemies isn't enough to make use of them, however. Scattered throughout the game are more powerful mini-boss enemies marked by a red icon. These marks will drop a hunt point upon being killed. Each trait has a specific hunt point cost associated with it, and those traits with multiple tiers will require more points with each level gained. While these mini-bosses are, generally speaking, optional content, you'll want to seek out and consume as many of them as you can, because traits are important. While the game also has a more traditional level-up mechanic, with each enemy killed giving mass that can be spent to level up a specific stat at the game's surrogate checkpoints, traits are often more important and potent than levels. Some of these can completely change your build, your playstyle, and can be the power boost that pushes you past a difficult boss. A few encounters into the game, you'll be given a weapon by Yawn, the first NPC you meet, and begin to actually engage enemies without absorbing them. The game has dozens of weapons found throughout it, each with its own moveset and special moves. Weapons are typically built upon and scale with three of your character's stats. Strength and Dexterity are fairly self-explanatory, used to specialize into either heavy or fast weapons, respectively. Resonance is a bit more unusual. It's easiest to describe it as the game's magic or arcane stat, though there isn't really such a thing as a long-distance caster build, as far as I've seen. But many of the game's more unusual and exotic weapons have resonance requirements and scaling. Also of note, however, is that many of the game's traits, such as one which damages enemies upon reflecting them, have resonance scaling. Between the variety of weapons with unique movesets, and how different traits can completely change your playstyle, the game supports a surprisingly wide range of builds. As an example, one of the game's weapons, the Attuning Lantern, even adds a debuff which increases the damage dealt by resonance scaling perks by 8% per stack, which opens up the idea of a resonance traits build, where reflecting, or similar perks, become your primary source of damage. Furthermore, Grime has a ton of different armor sets scattered throughout the game, at least one in each of the game's areas. These not only provide a buff to stats, but come with specific set bonuses for wearing all three pieces, usually greatly boosting the effectiveness of one or more traits, which is extremely useful, since some of the higher tiers of those traits can cost more hunt points than they're worth. Set bonuses can also include things like boosting mass gains. However, there's even one that's equivalent to Dark Souls' Calamity Ring, increasing damage dealt to the player for those seeking a challenge mode. The game also features a cosmetic slot, if you want the stats and perks for a certain armor set, but don't like the look of the piece. I've played through Grime three times since it released, once shortly after it came out where I played a strength build with the heaviest weapon I could find, a second time last summer when the idea for this video first started to form, where I did a dexterity build using faster weapons, and finally a third time after the Colors of Rot DLC released, where I did a dexterity resonance hybrid build because I wanted to try the Nail Scythe weapon. It's hard to do a direct comparison of how effective my builds were, because of course in my second and third playthrough, I had a much easier go of it than in my first, having already learned the game and many of the boss's patterns. What I will say is that I think I prefer the faster moveset overall, because 
many of the game's later bosses have extremely fast and unrelenting attack patterns. And it felt better to me to be able to get in quick hits during the small openings they left for me, rather than waiting for one massive hit. One of the most clever things about Grimes' mechanics, I think, is the game's use of color, which extends both to the combat and the game's platforming. Attacks, as well as projectiles or obstacles which are white, can be reflected. Anything which is red, such as flashing red attacks or obstacles, cannot be reflected, but can be safely dodged through. Things which are colored blue, usually associated with electricity, cannot be reflected or dodged through, and must be avoided entirely. Color coordinating the game's attacks like this creates a universal gameplay language, which lets a player know exactly what the boss's attack is, on some level, going to do whether you're in the first area or the last. Making this color coordination extend both to combat and obstacles in the world successfully keeps Grime from feeling separated into combat versus platforming sections, a trap which many Metroidvanias fall into. It doesn't feel like, this is the platforming part, now this is the combat part, now this is the platforming part. Instead, integrating those parts together well. That's not the only notable use of color, though. Yellow is used to indicate something can be pulled, once you've unlocked the game's pull ability from the second major boss. Again, this extends to combat as well. Some enemies will flash yellow during the wind-up for their attacks, and if you pull them fast enough, you can yank them right out of the attack, leaving them wide open to damage. The platforming of Grime feels a little unusual. I don't think it's... Bad, I think it feels good in the hands and is effective, but you definitely notice that there's a looseness to it. Your movements don't feel as precise as something like a Hollow Knight or a Celeste, and it will take some getting used to if you're expecting something tighter, especially early on. What is outright bad and frustrating about the platforming is that the game magnetizing you to platforms or ladders is not always consistent. Sometimes it'll magnetize you to platforms it feels like it shouldn't, and other times it will fail to register that you should be grabbing a ledge, even when it feels like you definitely made it. I've even had it grab on to crumbling platforms that were no longer there, something which should never happen. Thankfully, the platforming is pretty forgiving. Failing a jump, touching spikes, even falling to terminal velocity will only ever deal a little bit of damage to you, and then teleport you back to your last safe ground letting you quickly try again. Like most Metroidvanias, the platforming feels a lot better once you've unlocked the game's full movement kit. An air dash, a pull, a slow fall, eventually a double jump near the very end of the game, all of these can be chained together and end up making the platforming at the end so much more compelling than where it begins. By the end of the game, you're absolutely flying through the levels, and can cross whole sections of the map in what feels like no time at all. This is a really great Metroidvania movement kit, and it uses it creatively to hide some of the game's more devious secrets. The slow fall, specifically, was added with the game's DLC, and makes the platforming feel much better once you get it than it did in the vanilla game. The Weeping Cavity is a nearly perfect tutorial area. It's fairly easy with the game's most straightforward enemies, but it's also extremely memorable and visually evocative. A womb of stone, giving birth to many of the creatures that populate the world, but which only the most pathetic and deformed creatures stay in, unable to move on to the wider world. The stone eyes that follow you, the arms reaching out of the walls, creatures unable to move, creatures unable to access a wider range of senses and memories. These creatures are both literally and metaphorically trapped in Plato's cave, unable to see, unable to hear, unable to move, maybe even unable to think, born in this state and trapped there forever. Animate but without sensation to provide their movements meaning. The game's monster manual confirms this reading on them. Everything about this area spoke to me from the moment I saw it. Grime had its hooks in me within moments, 
even if the game had been bad, which it isn't, I needed to see every weird enemy design, every surreal environment, every art asset that existed within this game. Strange, gross, repulsive, and beautiful. The game promised an aesthetic that deserved to be painted and hung on the wall of an art gallery. And it's a promise which is delivered upon. The Weeping Cavity is also full of secrets. False walls, floors you can drop down through, hidden items, hidden enemies. It feels like you need to be poring over every square inch of the game to look for secrets. And again, that is a promise the game delivers on. In terms of secrets per square foot, I'm not sure I've played a game with more hidden nooks and crannies than Grime. Sometimes these hidden paths lead to an item, one of the game's motley pearls used to respec, or a piece of the armor set hidden throughout an area. Sometimes these secret paths lead to entirely new areas, new bosses, new skills, huge chunks of content that you'll never have your eyes drawn to directly. I love that sort of thing in games. The first time I played Grime, I was almost at the end of the game when I decided to try looking for anything I had missed. Among other things, I found an entire boss, the Misbegotten Amalgam, I had completely missed, as well as an entire optional area, the Ear Den. Few games have the courage to make that much content non-mandatory, let alone hide it so well that most players will completely miss it. But it makes games so much more special when they do. Oh, also, the game's director is Yarden Weisbrot. Yarden, Yarden, I get it. One small criticism I have is that while the game tutorializes most of the moveset well, the one thing it never tells you directly is how to do downward attacks. Jump, hold down, and hit your heavy attack button. This lets you destroy false floors, the same way you can destroy false walls simply by attacking them. You can do this right from the beginning of the game, if you know where a false floor is. The problem with this is that, as a Metroidvania, when I see something I don't know how to break through or interact with, I assume that I'm going to get an upgrade later on, which lets me pass that barrier. My first playthrough, I found a lot of false floors, made a note of where they were, and then moved on because I assumed I would get some sort of ground pound upgrade later on. It's a small issue, but it's one which could have been fixed easily by simply having a single mandatory breakable floor in the Weeping Cavity, and a tutorial pop-up which explains how to do this. The game's first boss, the Amalgam, is another extremely memorable element of the game's opening so much that it features heavily in the game's promotional materials. Beginning as a perfectly sculpted and proportional human face, it quickly cracks apart, revealing that the face we saw was a sort of shell this other, stranger being has hermit-crabbed his way into. Amalgam is certainly the game's easiest boss, but that's appropriate for the first boss of the game, essentially functioning only as the tutorial's final exam. If you've learned the mechanics the game has tried to teach you so far, absorb any attacks you can, dodge through those you can't, and you'll make short work of him. Defeating the Amalgam unlocks another major system, one which I've got complicated feelings about, Ardor. Ardor is a counter which exists next to your health and focus meters, going from zero up to a max of 100. You gain Ardor by killing enemies, especially by absorbing enemies. You lose a little ardor whenever you get hit. The more ardor you have, the more mass you get from killing enemies. Some traits also work with ardor, for example, increasing your damage in a proportional amount to your ardor. Death does not reduce your mass, but you still leave a husk, a bloodstain mechanic. If you die, your ardor will be reset to zero, and hitting your husk will give you half of your ardor back, or all of it if you have the appropriate trait, along with giving you a free heal. Ardor is an interesting system because it is a really great way of rewarding skilled play. In my second and third playthrough, I was sitting at max ardor nearly the entire time, and I was earning a tremendous amount of mass, 
and dealing greatly increased damage the whole time. The problem with this is that it's really a rich-get-richer mechanic, and I'm not sure I like that. Grime is already a difficult game, not the hardest Metroidvania I've played, but pretty demanding. By directly tying experience gain to expert play in this way, it means that the game becomes fundamentally easier for the players who are already playing well, and therefore need it the least. If you're playing well, you're going to get more mass and level up more times, which only makes things easier. If you're struggling on a boss or a difficult area, you'll simply be gaining less money and experience per kill. It's not a fundamentally flawed system, I think this is the intended effect, but I find that intention philosophically confusing. It would be like if Resident Evil 4's famous dynamic difficulty rewarded you with more ammo when you were already holding a lot of it, and withheld ammo from you if you were low. It would still be a form of dynamic difficulty, but instead of balancing the experience to feel appropriate to a player's individual skill level, it would make the game even more difficult for those struggling, and snowball those who don't need it into an unstoppable force. My first playthrough, where I was often running on low ardor, I finished the game in the 40s-ish level bracket. My second and third playthrough, where I was capped on ardor nearly the entire time and killing each boss on my first or second attempt, I ended the game at nearly the same exact point, level 74 and 72, respectively. That's a pretty huge difference in experience gained over the course of a playthrough. I wouldn't have an issue with this system if it was only tied to damage dealt, but to literally penalize experience gains in this way is just, I don't know, it's just a strange choice. The most divisive system in the game, though, is the mapping mechanic. Maps, and how they are implemented, are extremely important in a Metroidvania. How much information the game gives you, and how much it expects you to know for yourself, can completely change the tone of the entire game. Compare the feeling of the map in something like Metroid Dread, which auto-maps everything for you, up to and including items you have seen but haven't picked up yet, to something like Hollow Knight, which makes mapping much harder, requiring you to buy a map for each area, only updating at checkpoints, and not even showing the player's location without using one of your precious charm slots. Metroid's system fits the fast pace and kinetic movement of the game, while Hollow Knight's fits its much slower, more exploration and atmospheric approach. I think both systems are perfect for what that game is going for, but they completely change how you approach the game. Grime will auto-map rooms and areas you've visited, but you'll need to mark any points of interest you can't reach yet with a pin, up to a maximum of 27. 9 red, 9 blue, 9 yellow. The controversial part, though, is that much like Hollow Knight, you don't have a map of an area when you first visit it. Each area has a beacon somewhere within it. These vary from being very obviously on the critical path to being pretty well hidden, and how deep into a given area they are varies wildly. This makes initial progress into an area a lot more difficult, making it really easy to get lost until you find the area's beacon. This system has been widely criticized, but I mostly like it. It makes those early portions of exploring an area feel much more dangerous and mysterious. The feeling of getting lost and not knowing how to backtrack to safety if you need it has been mitigated with the Colors of Rot DLC, which introduced a sort of Hero's Path mechanic. A dotted line tracing your recent path through the area, which I think is a good compromise between the developer's original vision and the harder-to-get-lost approach many players asked for. The DLC also added icons that make reading the map much easier, such as ones marking where major boss rooms are and whether that boss is still alive or not. The one area I think the game really drops the ball here, though, is the Feaster's Lair. The Feaster's Lair is home to the game's third major boss. It's a sprawling, maze-like cave system, full of poison traps and tricky hidden enemies. The beacon here is actually being guarded by the boss, the Vulture. 
It's the only beacon guarded by a boss like this, and I think actually requiring you to kill a mandatory boss in order to unlock the map for that area is just one step too far. If it were shortly before the boss room, I wouldn't have this issue, and it would still make that first time through the zone feel confusing and scary, but I don't like how hard it makes backtracking out of the area, especially since the Vulture is a pretty big difficulty spike for the game, and you may end up needing to, say, backtrack to the NPC who will let you upgrade your weapons. While I'm talking about drawbacks with the game, I should also talk about the game's technical issues. When I first played Grime, a couple months after it was released, this was a major problem. Some boss fights would run at sub-20 FPS, certain walls couldn't be destroyed by certain weapons, the platforming felt far, far more inconsistent. The game was a technical mess. The good news is, it's gotten a lot better compared to where it was when it launched. The game is getting where it needs to be, and I have hopes that, as the game is still getting updates, it may reach the point where this disclaimer isn't needed at all somewhere down the line. That said, entire platforms consistently popping in and out of existence, or falling through the floor upon respawning directly into a boss room, these are major issues I still saw in my most recent playthrough, as recently as patch 1.11.91. I've heard of people having nastier problems too. Mini bosses never spawning, progression getting broken and soft locking saves, warp points not showing up once unlocked. I never had any of those things happen, but that's the sort of stuff that can ruin the experience of a game, even a great game. The technical issues have been ironed out well enough at this point, at least in my experience, that I'm comfortable recommending the game. It's a great game with some problems. I hope one day it will only be a great game. I trust, with how improved the game has become over the course of its life so far, that it will only get better from here. Grime's greatest strength is the design of its areas. Each area you come across is super distinct, with not only its own memorable aesthetic, but its own unique gameplay hooks. It also does one of my favorite things games with distinct levels can do contains unique enemies within each environment, who only show up in that area. It feels so much better to me when games do this, giving the world a real sense of ecology. To illustrate how excellent Grimes areas are, let's move past the Weeping Cavity and look at some of the earlier areas, all firmly in the first half of the game. Once you emerge from the Tutorial Cave, you find yourself in the Unformed Desert perhaps the game's most striking vista. A wide desert which is littered with broken fragments of massive carvings, taking the shape of people. Hands, heads, noses, ears, rain endlessly from the sky, landing at random on the seemingly infinite horizon. It's a surreal visual, and one which you, once again, won't have context for until the game's final moment. Speaking to NPCs, this is just how the world works. Statues falling from the heavens seems normal. My favorite shortcut in the game is unlocked while talking to an NPC here, as one of these broken statues falls directly next to the two of you, nearly crushing you and killing you both. Past this desert, you enter Lithic. Lithic is the first area you've visited with anything resembling civilization. Many of the stone creatures, like those you've encountered, are living here, seemingly in peace. The residents of Lithic are protected by their moms, the Whispering Mothers. These flower creatures are seemingly benevolent, and have sealed off the lift to lands beyond to protect their stoneborn children. The inhabitants of Lithic spend their time mining the siblings out of the ground, Often, the breath will animate creatures still deep beneath the earth, unable to move or do anything against the tons of rock sealing them within. The inhabitants of Lithic immediately recognize you as a threat, running to tell moms that the Carven are back. Something worth noting is that Grime, for all its surreal, gross, and sometimes horrifying visuals, also has a pronounced sense of humor. 
the way one of the rockheads runs off screaming tell moms or the way an insult slash threat used by some of the game's characters is to call someone a brick only to imply that it is literal there are jokes throughout the game and they work more than they don't for me the gameplay hook of Lithic is that it contains tons of moving pillars. It's a tried and true platformer mechanic, but it's also a good one to introduce as a level gimmick this early on, when you're still missing most of your platforming moveset. The game's first optional boss, the Harmless Rock Giant, can be found here. Most of the optional bosses in the game will, rather than giving you a new skill, grant an extra segment to your breath meter. There are six such optional bosses in the game for a maximum of three breath bars. You'll really want to be taking these optional bosses down as you go, because being able to hold three heals in your back pocket is going to be all but essential in the late stages of the game. Killing the Whispering Mothers will destroy this place. Lithic will fall apart without their protection. The moving platforms of the area will stop, changing the area and letting you access different sections if you choose to backtrack through it. And once you start the lift, the Carven will be able to return in force, and will take the children of Lithic away for their own nefarious purposes. You are dooming this place to destruction by passing through it. You are the Endgiver, after all. My favorite area of the game visually is just after Lithic, Nerve Root. First, you cross all of Nerve Root, flying above it on the Great Lift you've just activated. Seeing a fleshy forest below you immediately expands the scope of what this game is interested in doing visually. This is where the body horror elements of Grime really start to take center stage, moving away from just grotesque beings of stone and into actual flesh, taking form and life in a way it should not. You take the lift to the World Pillar. The World Pillar lies at the center of the world, and your ultimate destination you feel calling to you is at the top of this great tower. I say tower, but it is, in fact, a spinal column, reaching all the way to the highest and lowest points of the game's world. It is this world's Yggdrasil, with nerves and tendrils reaching out across the entire game, the Nerve Pass, functioning as the game's fast travel system. Your next actual destination after fighting the Whispering Mothers is the Feaster's Lair, which lies just below Lithic in the Unformed Desert. But you'll need to travel back downward through the area you just passed over with Lithic's Great Lift in order to reach it, Nerve Root. Nerve Root is, as described, a forest made of fleshy nerves, running out of the spinal column that is the World Pillar. This is where the blue electricity mechanic, which cannot be dodged through, is first introduced, with many gates being formed by nerves which are shooting electrical connections together. These can be disabled by finding vulnerable connection nodes and pulling them out. Nothing happening here should be off-putting or horrifying. It is a demonstration of nerves and connections working as they are supposed to. Yet, this reminder that, on some level, our senses, our emotions, are just illusions presented by electrical and chemical processes in the body, is terrifying. There are enemies, or perhaps obstacles, introduced here that appear to be giant neurons free-floating throughout the air. Looking at Nerve Root, ironically, just puts a little tingle at the back of my spine. There's a power to this visual. This idea of traversing a forest of flesh, on a micro level beyond that of what we normally see even in horror games that deal in flesh hallways and skin walls. Fantastic Voyage played for horror. Nerve Root is also where the Colors of Rot DLC starts to come into play in a major way. While the DLC's headlining feature was the addition of a new area, Childbed, it actually made changes and additions to the whole game on a widespread level. Nerve Root, which did not have a boss in the game's vanilla version, has had one added. The Flower Heart will spawn a series of boss enemies sharing a health bar, animated by flowers in the same room. 
This idea of stones being overtaken by plant life was a theme in the game's original release, but it takes center stage in Colors of Rot and Childbed. Defeating the Flower Heart grants the first of the DLC's new abilities, a sprint, which makes quickly getting around the world more convenient. Childbed, where the bulk of the new content exists, is actually accessible very early on, as soon as the end of Nerve Root. This is where we get some new context for the Whispering Mothers, which was not provided in the vanilla game. Childbed exists right below Lithic, and you can find versions of the Lithic inhabitants who have been overtaken by a parasitic plant growth. One who speaks even screams to its moms about the pain. Not the old pain, but a new pain it must share with something else. Was this what the Whispering Mothers had planned for their children? In the original game, I thought the Whispering Mothers were removed from the garden area. That they had come from there, but found children they genuinely loved, and chose to set up shop in Lithic to protect them. Perhaps, the DLC implies, they wanted the children of Lithic for their own selfish purposes, just as the Carven did. Plant life being played as a parasitic horror to these beings of stone is a pretty powerful and evocative idea. It reminds me of DC Comics' Swamp Thing and how the green is portrayed. A force of slow, creeping inevitability. The flowers, the plant life, is alien, other. It cannot be understood in the way we assign reason to forms of life more similar to our own. Maybe the Whispering Mothers never intended to be viewed as maternal figures. Maybe the children of Lithic were reading something relatable into their completely alien actions and thoughts. While you can access Childbed very easily, you'll want the game's full movement kit to traverse all the way through it. You can access the first boss of Childbed here, though, the Giant of Eyes. Childbed contains two remixed boss fights, with entirely new second phases, the Giant of Eyes being a new version of the Harmless Rock Giant, and the Surrogate Vulture being added clear to the other side of Childbed at the Garden entrance. The Strand of the Child you end up going to the Garden for has actually been moved to the Surrogate Vulture's boss room now, essentially adding a boss fight to another area which didn't previously have one, the Garden. This means Surrogate Vulture is the only boss added by the DLC who is now, in fact, mandatory. Defeating the Giant of Eyes now unlocks the game's full fast travel system, allowing you to freely warp from checkpoint to checkpoint, which used to be relegated to the game's post-game, only unlocking when you beat the final boss. Beating that final boss will now unlock the ability to rematch boss fights at any time from the Surrogate checkpoint menu. While you can access the Giant of Eyes really early in the game, I don't recommend fighting it yet. I found it to be the most difficult of the game's new bosses, and I didn't end up taking it down until I was much higher level. The DLC also adds a whole host of new secrets, my favorite being these living pot guys hidden throughout the world now. These guys were already an easter egg in the game's original release, hidden past a difficult platforming section at the top of the Weeping Cavity but with nothing to them, seemingly just a reference to the then-upcoming Elden Ring. Now, there are a few spots where you can find, and in fact, fight, these guys. If the body horror of nerves doesn't get you, then the body horror of teeth might. Feaster's Lair is one of the game's scariest areas, certainly the one played the most completely straight for horror. Everything about the Feaster's Lair feels hostile. This is a place that does not want you, a place that ought not be. This is the game's poison area, a winding maze full of traps and danger zones, which must be avoided by using your pull ability to quite literally pull teeth out of the fleshy, wet walls to become temporary platforms. Those with a phobia of teeth? I won't sugarcoat it, this area might be a rough time. If you're willing to explore it thoroughly, though, Feaster's Lair has some of the most compelling secrets in the game, a hidden path to another entirely optional area, which itself leads to yet another optional area. 
the hidden Misbegotten Amalgam boss, a remix of the game's first boss, who becomes one of the vanilla game's most difficult fights. Hiding this much interesting content in one of the game's most hostile areas, again, shows great courage on the part of the developers. If it hasn't come across from the footage I've shown and the way I've been describing things, grime is an aesthetic triumph. It looks amazing, and it sounds amazing, both in its sound design and its music. There are moments of surreal beauty and moments of repulsive horror, sometimes both at once. The game has an impeccable sense of atmosphere, an otherworldly, ethereal quality that persists through the entire game. Feaster's Lair uses that incredible aesthetic to great effect for horror, to evoke discomfort and disgust in the player. At this point, I'd like to talk about the game's narrative. The story up through the end of the game, as well as a couple of major set-piece moments which require speaking, frankly, with absolute spoilers. The story Grime tells, the themes of the game, are pretty abstract and hard to understand, and the ending of the game is something I've been chewing on for well over a year now, and I'd like to talk about it, what I think it means, and what I think the game as a whole is trying to say. If anything I've said here sounds interesting, you should absolutely go play the game yourself. And some of the game's later surprises are really special. So here's your spoiler warning. Turn off the video, go play the game. The game is good. This is where the heavy spoilers start. Abandon hope, all who enter here. Are they gone? Okay. Once you make it out of the Weeping Cavity, the nature of the world really starts to lay itself out in front of you. The only NPC you meet in the tutorial area is Yawn, who was used to communicate one of the game's most major themes to the player. Yawn is one of the misshapen creatures born in this cave, though one of the more mobile and sentient among them. When he sees you, he is overtaken by your form. Proportional, beautiful. Not misshapen, not malformed. He essentially pledges himself to you because of your beautiful, flawless form. This is going to be important to the game's narrative. Yawn is essentially mistaking you for a Carvin, a mistake several of the game's NPCs will make, though you won't yet have context for what that means. When you eventually start to encounter the Carvin, you discover what they truly are. They are the same beings as those stoneborn creatures found in Lithic, but they choose to chisel away at their bodies until they reach what we the players would recognize as more natural proportions. Through a long, painful process, they ascend from their misshapen nature into proportional perfection. The reason they came and abducted those in Lithic was either to force them into this process, to reproduce, to create more carven, or worse yet, to use them as literal living bricks in their great palace. The carven you meet hate you, violently hate you, because they see you as an imposter. Not understanding what you really are, they assume you are one like those of Lithic, but who was chiseled into the shape of a carven without going through their long process of suffering. An imposter. A blasphemy. Ascension to the form of carven is Jan's real goal, worshipping the carven as gods, and thinking from the start of the game that you are such a carven who has come to take him to the servant's path where this process takes place. Yon is one of the game's most prominent NPCs because we see him go through this entire process, from his birthplace, where you first meet him, to Lithic, where he begins preaching the virtues of your proportional perfection to others, to the servant's path, where he chooses to maim his own body in order to become what he thinks the old pain is telling him he's meant to be. We watch him suffer on the servant's path, only to discover that nothing is different. He still feels the old pain. He still suffers. The Carvin still suffer. They still look ever upward. Jan wonders if those made of the flesh, the Coda, who the Carvin worship, hold the real secret to ending the old pain. In a sense, we'll find that they do, but not in the way Jan wants. 
Jan will never be able to learn what secrets the Coda hold, though, if you kill them. He supported you when you were destroying, as he calls them, the Uglies, but now that he sees you intend to destroy everything, he tries to stop you himself. It's futile, of course. What you discover over the course of the game is that it's not only the stone creatures like Jan worshipping the Carven. The world of Grime is built upon everyone worshipping one level up. Through the entire game, each trying to find a way to deal with the old pain. We watch this happen by seeing Jan live through a good portion of this life cycle. The Rockheads become servants of the Carven in order to try to earn their worth. They toil on the servant's path, doing whatever menial labor the Carven give them, suffering and weathering the abuse of their Carven masters, with the promise of one day becoming proportional perfection, no longer feeling the old pain that tells them they are wrong. We see Jan go through this process and discover that nothing has changed, that he still feels the same hurt down in his very bones. The Carven we see in the palace have simply shifted their worship another level up, following creatures of the flesh, which turns out to actually be wax, called the Coda. The Carven have been rejected by the Coda, who they worship, and are building the palace, their great monument, to try to appease them, struggling to understand why their gods have forsaken them. The most powerful Carven we meet wear this wax on their own bodies, trying to become more like their gods. Where this gets really good, though, is when you finally meet the Coda face to face. When you get the item that lets you enter their Cenotaph City, Shidra, who we'll talk about in a moment, tells you that so far, you've only been faced with beings who hate you. The Coda, on the other hand, worship you. How will you deal with those who adore you? When you finally reach Cenotaph City, the Coda applaud you. They cheer. The reason the Coda are called the Coda is because they are eagerly awaiting their death. They seek to be a Coda, a final remark on existence. Their city is called Cenotaph City, the word Cenotaph meaning a monument to a group of people, because that is what they seek it to be. They understand what you are the Endgiver, offering this exhausted, tired world, crying out in pain, its ending. They only seek to be remembered by what comes after. You. The entirety of Cenotaph City, a beautiful golden city near the top of the world, has been built for you. Every golden spire, every work of art, all for you. The Coda want to die. They want to be absorbed but they want to go out with fireworks, joy, and celebration. They sealed the other creatures of the world out of their city because they knew they couldn't understand this, their solution to the old pain. They have spent an unspecified amount of time, but what's implied to be ages, waiting for you to come and unwrap their present. This is what the game's best and most memorable boss fight is, the final performance. The Coda have put their entire existence into creating a perfect stage for a dance with the player, a memorable spectacle so that you will remember them. This boss fight is wonderful. It is the most perfect the game ever becomes. Integrating every element that makes the game great together flawlessly. Gorgeous visuals, fluid animation, demanding platforming, thrilling combat. Though you can still take damage and die in this fight, it successfully manages to feel not like a hostile encounter, but a friendly, loving one. A boss fight as dance, a dance as boss fight. It deserves to be in the video game boss fight hall of fame. There's a bit of a meta-commentary element to this as well, and to Grime as a whole. While it's not the game's primary theme, a recurring question that is asked of you throughout the game is why you're doing this, why you're doing all of this. Traversing this world, killing the inhabitants of it, giving this world its end. Is it because you enjoy the violence? It's a bit Spec Ops the line, initially seems a bit, perhaps you are actually bad for playing this video game in the only way we allowed for. 
There were over 5,000 people alive in Dubai the day before you arrived. How many are alive today, I wonder? That sort of thing. I like this version of that question, though, because it offers another possibility. Perhaps it's not the thrill of violence. Perhaps you are driven instead by curiosity. A desire to see what this world has in store, and a desire to absorb, if you will, what this game has to offer. It's important that the final performance is as perfect as it is, because it means that the game successfully communicates its point mechanically, not just narratively. The Coda have arranged this performance so that you, the Endgiver, will remember them. The final performance is memorable. It is the most memorable fight in the game. In five years, I doubt I'll remember the specifics of fighting the Vulture, or the Jaw Crab, or the Misbegotten Amalgam. I think, however, that I will remember the Coda, even well after I've put the game down. The game doesn't give a definitive answer to the question of why we play games. It leaves it ambiguous, because there isn't any one answer. Some of us do like the violence, by which I mean we like the mechanical feeling of combat, of movement, in the games. That's not wrong, that's not evil. I like the second answer offered here, though. When a game gets its hooks in me, what I find most compelling of all isn't the idea of proving myself against a difficult boss, though don't get me wrong, I enjoy that too, it's just this feeling that I want to see what's next. That idea I spoke of earlier, when I started Grime. I felt myself pulled forward by the need to see each surreal vista, each weird mechanical idea, each art asset. It's curiosity. The dance with the coda is beautiful, both aesthetically and mechanically. It is the perfect coda to the people of this world, at least those who have chosen to live in this flawed system. There are those who exist outside of this system, however. We've already talked about the organic flower creatures and how alien they are. Even some of those born of stone seem to have chosen another path, though. Those monsters who live in Feaster's lair. Where some of the stone creatures like Yon seek to deal with the old pain by carving their bodies away, others have chosen to give into the old pain, letting white-hot anger and blinding agony define them. The monsters of Feaster's Lair are heavily implied to have once been sentient creatures like those you've met, just ones who chose to lean into this pain, instead of escape from it, going feral, becoming animalistic monsters, twisted and shaped by their rage into new forms. The most important figure to the plot we encounter who exists outside of this system, however, is Shidra. The world pillar is inhabited by a huge, powerful creature known as Shidra. Shidra is deified and respected by the people of this world. Shidra is also the first character you've met who seems to truly know what you are, calling you Aklan, and speaking of you with restrained disdain. Shidra has fingers reaching throughout the rest of the game. Shidra's servants guard the Nerve Pass, connecting the world. Some have become corrupted, though, or perhaps have broken free of Shidra's will, and fight to prevent the Nerve Pass from being reconnected. They will give you an ominous warning when you fight them. Trust not those who want to live. Shidra sends you on fetch quests throughout the game to get him items. He sends you to the Feaster's Lair to get an item from the Vulture, and he sends you to the Garden to get something called the Strand of the Child a flower with petals shaped like human figures, holding hands and forming a ring. Shidra does help you throughout the game, letting you through several of the game's impassable barriers and upgrading your weapons for you, but there's always a sense of malice to Shidra, that you shouldn't quite trust them. It's no surprise, then, that Shidra is the game's final boss. Shidra even acknowledges this, that you must have known this was coming, and muses whether you played along because you enjoyed the game of it, or for another reason. After you bring the coda the end they crave, you are able to reach the top of the world pillar, the place you felt calling to you for the entire game. Just before you reach the peak, 
Shidra confronts you. Shidra doesn't want you to bring the end. Shidra fears death, fears the end of everything they've ever known. The items you've gathered for Shidra have all been to create a prison for you. And Shidra offers you a choice, tries to appeal to your better nature, and asks that you let yourself be contained. Shidra knows someday it will all come to an end, inevitably. But this way, that end can be pushed off a little further. Maybe one day you'll break through. Maybe one day another like you will come. But it won't be today. That is enough. If you let Shidra contain you, then you'll get the game's first ending. Weakness. The title of the ending is itself a criticism. Shidra wants to live because for Shidra, worshipped as a god, brought offerings, placed in a position of power, things aren't so bad. But we've seen this world is suffering. The creatures here are wrong. They are in pain. And they are begging to be put out of their misery. Though the Colors of Rot DLC doesn't add any new interactions with Shidra directly, it does indirectly give us some tremendous insight into their motivations, and the extent of their planning. The new area added in Colors of Rot is called Childbed, and it lies at the very base of the World Pillar. If the name didn't give you enough indication, this is a womb where the child lies, unborn, waiting to awaken. When you reach Childbed, some of Shidra's assistants are there to tell you what your mission is. The child stirs. Its consciousness is coalescing, and has overtaken the area's two bosses. You need to kill the Giant of Eyes and the Surrogate Vulture in order to scatter the child's consciousness and lull it back to sleep. You can keep exploring further and further into Childbed, though, far past either of the bosses of the area all the way to the very base of the World Pillar, where you can find the child itself. You can hear its thoughts echo, confused, formless, unborn. What's telling here, though, is what the child is being contained in. A gigantic version of the very same golden-ringed prison which Shidra tries to contain you in before the final boss fight. The child is meant to be born, but Shidra knows letting it be born would mean the end of this world, of this age, and so has prevented it from fully forming and waking up. Shidra even used their servants to manipulate the player character into helping do this again, push the child back into slumber, another way to push off the inevitable. If you explore all the way down here, though, you can interact with the child. You can see it stir and awaken, which will slightly change the game's true ending. Shidra is the villain of this game, letting this world carry on and suffer is the bad ending, because it is unnatural. The world should not carry on. These creatures are born of stone, and will therefore live forever in a painful, miserable existence. They know this isn't right. They feel it in their very bones, this aching old pain. Shidra's assistants who break free and try to cut off the nerve pass tell you as much. Trust not those who want to live. Once you beat Shidra, a brutal boss fight, easily the hardest in the vanilla game at least, you can reach the peak of the world pillar and are able to see the game's true ending, the kinship ending. Here is where we can finally see things for what they really are. The reason this world has so many strange, fleshy elements, the reason why its world tree is a spine, the reason nerves stretch from one end of the world to another, is because everything we've seen so far has been inside of one of those massive god beings we saw in the game's very first few moments. We see in the distance other such god beings, being consumed by black holes, their bodies crumbling into nothing. This is why the unformed desert had an endless rain of broken statue pieces, shards of these other god beings getting caught in our world's gravity and pulled to earth. 
If we are within or upon a great being, a great creature, then it changes what we understand the creatures we've seen over the course of the game to be. Perhaps these stone beings we've seen are a sort of sentient cancer in the body of a dying god. Cells growing out of control, without regard for form or function. Maybe the teeth grown without purpose or reason in Feaster's Lair are teratoma. The raging beasts of that area, the most aggressive of cancers. Maybe Shidra, an insectoid creature who seems to exist outside of the rules of this world, is a literal parasite, unnaturally feeding off of a host. Why is the DLC called The Colors of Rot? Maybe the dead body we are inside of is beginning to decay, beginning to rot away. The note the game ends on sees our character, our endgiver, expand, becoming a black hole that destroys the beings we've been inside of all this time, just like all the others we see far off in the distance. It implies all of this has happened before, and will happen again. When I first saw this ending, I wasn't sure what to think. It's abstract, strange, and abrupt. Grime has so many ideas, but it felt like I was missing some piece that held them all together. Even the second time I played, it felt like I didn't quite have what the game was saying in my grasp. What are you, the endgiver, in all of this? It's only while writing this script, while putting down all of my thoughts on a very complicated abstract game, that I feel like I'm getting a handle on what it all means, what Grime is trying to say. Let's look at some of the major groups you encounter throughout the game. I think a case exists that the people you visit, and how each of them deals with the old pain, largely follows a pattern of the five stages of grief. I know, this work is about the five stages of grief is a little pop culture analysis 101, but just stay with me here, there's more to it than that. The people in Lithic are in a childlike denial about the old pain. Those living there are ignoring the old pain, pretending it doesn't exist. It's a taboo to even ask about, as you see with the merchant who will trade you the art you found for armor. He begins to wonder aloud if you still feel the old pain, and then catches himself. The inhabitants of Lithic have chosen to deal with the old pain by ignoring it. Until you show up, they don't really have any reason to hurt to feel a gnawing dread. Yet you can see from this interaction, they still do. Just as Yawn feels the old pain, that eternal gnawing that something is wrong, so do each and every one of these stone creatures. The creatures in Feaster's Lair have rejected society, rejected fundamental humanity. They are implied to have once been creatures like those in Lithic, but instead of trying to join the Serpent's Path and trying to carve the old pain out of their flesh, they chose to grip the pain as tightly as they can, becoming animalistic avatars of hate and rage. That's why this zone is so unpleasant, why it involves, literally, pulling so many teeth. Those who walk the Servant's Path are quite literally bargaining, even bartering, to try to rid themselves of the old pain. They're trying to work for the Carven, to suffer their way to perfection, to earn their way into the Promised Land. They're trying to buy their way out of that old pain, through works, through craft and artistry. The Carven Palace is inhabited by those who have succeeded in this endeavor, who have sculpted themselves to proportional perfection. Those carven we meet who have made it to the top of the food chain, though, like the Desert Watcher or the Artisan of Flesh, seem to still be filled with a profound emptiness, a depression. They have chosen to sit in their palace until the end times, idly building their palace higher and higher, greater and greater, yearning for something more. The Coda, then, are acceptance. Those who have chosen to accept the old pain. To accept the end. They feel how wrong it is to have life in bodies of stone and wax, to be animate when you should be inanimate, and they want it to end. They want to be remembered, not to be eternal. If the game is about grieving, who then are you grieving? Perhaps it's a parent, 
the life-giving force is called the parent's breath, after all. I think, though, that it's deeper than that. I think that you are death, not an avatar of death, not the Grim Reaper or a god ruling over death like Hades, but the biological process of death. Think back to Nerve Root. Think back to what you were doing to pass through those blue barriers. Disconnecting nerves, stopping the flow of electricity from one to the next. What is that if not the body of the dying being you are inside of shutting down? This game is about grieving yourself, about coming to terms with mortality. You are the end giver. You are mortality. You are death. Not a malicious or evil death, but a beautiful one. A natural one that comes to all living things. In that first cutscene of the game, we see the breath pass from one of these god beings to another. If we follow the DLC to its conclusion, then we get extra dialogue at the end of the game, in that final area after Shidra, where we can hear the child, now awake, its thoughts now collected, speak to us. The breath passes from one of these beings to the next, in an endless line we see implied at the end of the game. When you platform in the Pale Sky, from the end of the Coda fight to the encounter with Shidra, you can find Coalesced Breath, which when broken, lets us hear memories. What sounds like the dying breath of a parent at the birth of a child. The voice sounds distressed. It's leaving the child with problems it knows it will need to suffer. Our eternal existence, does it give it passage, the voice wonders? It is inside. We cannot avoid it. I wonder, does this refer to Shidra? A parasite that has perverted the life cycle of these beings? Or is it something else, more profound? The voice seems to contradict itself here, saying it has an eternal existence, but also knowing that it is dying. At least the end is beautiful, the voice says. Maybe their eternal existence is not about any one of them on their own. Perhaps it is the breath, the passing of the torch on to a new generation. Knowledge, memory, life. Though no single generation will live forever, there's always the children of the world waiting to carry it forward. One day those children will grow old, and then pass the parent's breath on to another. Each of these beings we see at the end is a parent, and a child, in an endless chain onwards to infinity, the breath of life passing between each of them. Maybe what lives within them, what they give passage in this way, is not Shidra, but the burden of life. We see that the breath is not only life, but memory, when we hear the echoes of the parent. The breath is life, the breath is experience. The breath is knowledge. It is passed from each generation into the next, added to, and then passed on again. It is inside of them. It cannot be avoided. That responsibility to take this breath unto themselves and pass it on to the next, that is what lives inside of them. The breath is given passage by this eternal cycle, this eternal existence. It is a great privilege and a terrible burden. The child has just been born. One day, it will pass the breath on and experience its own beautiful ending, ever onward into eternity. But that's just a theory. A game. Grime is a game I haven't been able to get out of my head since I first played it in late 2021. In just over a year, I've played the whole game three times, gotten all of the achievements, and still, I feel like I could go replay it again right now. It's an imperfect game, particularly on a technical front, but beyond its rough edges is one of my favorite games of recent years, a game that's been overlooked by a wider audience. 
but which deserves to be considered a classic of the genre every bit as much as games like Metroid Dread or Hollow Knight. It's hard to find information about Grime online, hard to find text walkthroughs, even though the reviews you can find for it from the time of release are incredibly positive. Hollow Knight has more recent reviews on Steam than Grime has lifetime ones. This game feels like it was just lost in the shuffle to me, and it deserves so much more. I love this game with all my heart. Its visuals are both surreally beautiful and disgusting all at once. Its combat and the platforming, once you have all of the upgrades, are kinetic and engaging. Its world is expertly crafted and full of fascinating secrets. Its story is abstract yet engaging. The creators should be proud of this, their debut game, as in my opinion, it stands shoulder to shoulder with giants. Grime has become one of my favorite games of the decade so far, one of the first games I think of when I think of this new wave of Metroidvanias. It feels like one of those games I will revisit every few years, and walk away having enjoyed every minute of the experience. I hope that I've convinced you to give it a try. I know I'm glad I did.